Hello. Um, in this section, we're going to explore and introduce the, the practice continuum. So one of the first decisions a coach makes when they're designing their session is what types of practice am I going to use? Which, which types of practice will be the best in, in helping me achieve my intention? Um, so remembering that, that, that our session intention will will really shape and, and guide the decisions we make. Um, once we've got that nailed down, we then need to think about what, what, what are the building blocks for our session and what types of practice will we use. Um, so the idea of the continuum is to help coaches understand the, the kind of trade-offs, so strengths and limitations, um, and options they've got in front of them. Um, and by putting them into a continuum and presenting them on a, on a graph, it really helps helps me when I'm coaching think, right, where, where, where am I going to position myself today? Um, it's really important that we we don't, there's no judgment associated with either end of the continuum. Um, and the most important thing is that the coaches understand what, where, when, and why, um, as opposed to this end is good or, or that end is bad. Um, so the continuum is made up of two axes. Um, so the Y axis has um, at the top end an increased amount of variability and at the bottom end a decreased amount of variability. So variability and, and, and is, I guess, in really simple terms, the amount of chaos and instability within the environment. Um, when a player picks the ball up in an invasion game, how many options do they have available to them? Um, and the, the more they have, the, the more variability they have in, in there. In terms of movement, if you've got a gymnast, um, the more complex a move um, or a combination of moves, the more variability there is involved. Um, the more joints or, or parts of the body involved in a movement, the more variability as well. So it just helps us understand that that one end might be high variability, high complexity, and the other end might be low variability or, or lower complexity. Um, on the on the x axis is the level of representation. So how at the, at the top end, the high end, um, are environments that are as close to the performance environment as we possibly can get them. And at the bottom end are environments that are as far away from the performance environment that we might use in our training. Um, and again, there are pros and cons to, to operating at either end of this continuum. And what we what we did is we we lined up different practices from different sports to help us really make these decisions. So I'll talk you through an example from invasion games, because um, that's my bias. Um, so at the top end we had macro games. Um, and this is for sort of soccer or, or field hockey, where the numbers are 11 aside. So at the top end is a macro game, numbers 8 to 11. Um, and in this, we, if we were going after some, some bigger scale tactical elements, um, if we were looking for some physical um, intentions that required them running similar distances and um, sprint distances to a game, then we might operate this end as well. Um, one of the disadvantages of, of using a macro game is, is players tend to get less touches of the ball and less interactions with the ball. So whilst it's very representative, um, a, a striker in football or soccer may only get one shot in the game. So if, if you wanted them to get lots of reps at practicing their shooting, probably not the right, the right type of practice. Um, as you move down the continuum, we, we sort of move into small-sided games with sort of four and eight players, and you get a bit of both in here. This is where sort of your bang for buck argument comes in. Um, so they get lots of repetitions, lots of touches in a four v four, and still some of the principle-based tactical decisions that they might need to make, especially as you, if you move sort of six v six, seven v seven. Um, the small unit play um, is sort of your three v twos, two v twos, those types of practices. So. Loads of interactions of the ball, loads of goes, um, lots of decisions to be made on, on a kind of two players interacting together. Um, not not the tactical elements that we might want to practice in the bigger games. Um, opposed practice would be um, a 1v1 um, or a 1v2 potentially. Um, so really looking at some of the technical elements of maybe defending 1v1 or dribbling and attacking 1v1. Down into some unopposed practice. So unopposed practice would be um, potentially lots of technical repetition of a, cer a certain type of passing, 
but we'd make sure there's lots of variability included in it and a little bit more chaos. So there's still decisions to be made, which gap to pass through, which player to try and pass to, the distances they'd be passing would change, um, and, and also the, the type of pass might change as well. And then right at the bottom is block practice. So in this type of practice, we tend to control quite a lot of the variables. We tend to make the uh, the action the same and, and repeat it. So if we were looking at push pass over 15 meters on the forehand to forehand, we would look at re repeating that in blocks. Um, so limited variability, but maximum number of reps at a certain action. So as you can see from the continuum, um, it all depends on what you're trying to get out of the practice. Um, use this to help you decide based on your intention, what type of practice will be best for you. And remember, it's not a move from bottom to top. It's a start at the top, then pick something from the bottom, and then jump to something in the middle, if that's what's best for your session. Um, we've included a, a couple of examples from different sports. So our tennis example, the top end, complete match play. So as close to the performance environment as possible, you know, games, sets, um, points, tie breaks, um, elimination based on the, on the result if we can. So can we recreate tournament play? Um, moving down through condition games and conditioning points and then slowly into some more condition shots, variable practice and block practice. So we're getting more specific with the technical elements as we head down the bottom. Swimming. So um, many thanks to... Um, my uh, swimming colleague, Gareth McNary, uh, for helping me put this one together. Um, so at the top end, we've got the race meet. So can we practice race meets in our training? Um, can we get play, uh, our, our swimmers to the pool? And if they don't hit their time in their, in their first um, heat, then they don't go through to the semi or the final. So we recreate that. And obviously we wouldn't want to do that every session. We definitely wouldn't want to do it every week. Um, but learning to execute and put down our, our fastest time is a really important skill. Um, we then shift down as we move down the continuum. Um, the swimmer comes away from their race pace um, and down towards more aerobic training, more technical drills, land training and more heart rate training. So the further you are towards the bottom, um, the more specific um, technical elements we might be working on.